All right. Hello. Welcome to Politics and Pros Live. My name is Bashan Horsley, part of the event staff of Politics and Pros. Before we get started, just a few uh, housekeeping rules here. The first is that we ask for anyone uh, viewing, if you have any questions that you would like to ask the author, we would ask for you to place them in the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of the screen, not the chat section, so that we can just help um, facilitate that when it is time. The second is that um, at any time during this event, you will be able to go to the chat section, uh, click on a link that will be posted in there, which will take you directly to Politics and Pros website, and you will be able to purchase a copy of Finding My Father um, directly from Politics and Pros. Um, so um, that is always a much needed and appreciated part of what we're doing here. Um, that said, we would like to welcome to Politics and Pros Live, Deborah Tannen. Um, in this memoir, memoir, excuse me, called Finding My Father, his century-long journey from World War I and my quest to follow, Deborah Tannen embarks on the poignant yet perilous quest to piece together the puzzle of her father's life, beginning with his astonishingly vivid memories of the Hasidic community in Warsaw, where he was born in 1908, she traces his journey from arriving in New York in 1920 to quitting high school at 14 to support his mother and sister through a vast array of jobs, inclu including prison guard and gun toting, alcohol tax inspector, to eventually establishing the largest workers' compensation law practice in New York and running for Congress. As Tan become as Tenet comes to better understand her father's and her own relationship to Judaism, she uncovers aspects of his life she would have never imagined. Deborah Tannen is the acclaimed author of You Just Don't Understand, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for nearly four years. <gasps> New York Times bestseller, You're Wearing That, about mothers and daughters, <laughs> and You Were Always Mom's Favorite, about sisters, <laughs> as well as several other books. Um, she is a professor of linguistics at Georgetown University. She appears frequently on national television and radio. And Deborah is joined in conversation tonight by Susan Stamberg. Um, Susan is a nationally renowned broadcast journalist and a special correspondent for National Public Radio. Stamberg is the first woman to anchor a national nightly news program and has won every major award in broadcast. Stamberg is the author of two books, Talk NPR, Susan Stanberg Considers All Things, published in 1993, and Every Night at Five, published in 1982. Without further ado, Deborah Tannen and Susan Stanberg. Thank you. Hi, Deb. Hey there. We've, we have to tell them that we're really good friends. So as a really good friend, I say to you, bravo. I thank think you, we had so two much. years of dinners on and off in which we heard about the, what this process was like, and you talked about it, and the wrestle, and by gum, she's done it, ladies and gentlemen. So to begin, could you just read, because I think that first paragraph of yours is absolutely a knockout, and let, let's let the folks who are with us hear that. So this is, this is the beginning. I adored my father. He's the parent I felt an affinity with, the one I thought understood me. I traced to him my love of words, of language, of reading, and of writing. When my father was home, he was often sitting at his desk writing. That remained his favorite place to be, his favorite thing to do, until he died two weeks before his 98th birthday. I don't know if I was emulating him or expressing the genes he passed on, but when I was a child, the object I loved most was an old black manual typewriter with yellowing keys rimmed in tarnished silver. I typed poems and stories and letters to my father, telling him what happened to me during the day, often laying out grievances against my mother I talked to my father through letters because when I was growing up, he was rarely home. 
the strongest presence I felt in the house was his absence. A sense of yearning for him stayed with me long after I was grown. And look what you've done. You've spent, what is it, 200, 300 something pages getting back with him and being with him. We'll talk about that a little later. What, what uh, a difference having finally gotten this book organized and written has made uh, in your life. But that sentence, uh, the strongest presence I felt in the house was his absence. Oh my goodness, it gives me chills. I think so many children have that feeling when the parents uh, go away or, you know, the, a certain homesickness. But this was a, a presence for you. You know, um, I think quite a few daughters probably feel that about their fathers. Often it's the father uh, who's away more. Uh, of course, uh, now it may be the mother who's away more. Um, but in, in my case, my father... Uh, first of all, he worked in a factory, as you heard in the overview, although he was a lawyer and had a law degree for various reasons. Um, he was not able to practice law until he was 50, although he, he had um, graduated law school and passed the bar 30 years earlier. That's a big part of the story. Um, but he worked in a factory in the garment district in a coat factory. And so he worked overtime during the week. He worked Saturdays. And he was very active in politics, which is how he ended up running for Congress on the Liberal Party ticket in third party in New York City. And so he was almost never there. And yeah. because he was the one I felt so connected to, uh, and um, he was the one that I felt knew who I was and, and understood me. Um, and so that feeling that the parent I was with all day was not the one who I really wanted to be with. And yeah. 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 And of course, as you say, writing the book was a way to get him back, <laughs> keep him with me. And, um, and he's here tonight. Yes, so he is. Uh, you uh, sent me a note uh, uh, when I told you that I'd gotten in the mail at last a hard copy of this. And uh, I want to share this with, with uh, our audience. He said, I saw and held the first bound copy yesterday. I was so excited. My heart was pounding and my hands shaking. I don't remember reacting that way to a book since the very first one, 26 books back in 1984. Yes. So why? What was in that reaction of yours that made your heart go pound? Yeah, I mean, 26 books, that's a lot. Yep, yep. Well, it's because, first of all, the story being so personal, Mm -hmm. um, and all, and that made it a lot harder to write, um, and but also so much more meaningful. All my other books are based on my academic research. Um, I always use personal stories, talk about my personal relationships. So my book about mothers and daughters has lots about my mother. Uh, my book about sisters has lots about my sisters, but this one was so personal. Uh, but also, I had wanted to write it for so long. Uh, and I found it hard to write, and therefore it took longer than mm -hmm. any of the other books I'd ever written. Uh, when um, my father wasn't ill until just a week before he died, and, but his last week was in the hospital. And, um, you know, they tell you he, he had gone in with a heart attack and then had a stroke. So he was not responsive, but the hospice people told us, talk to him, he can hear. And, uh, and I said to him at, there in the hospital, thinking he could hear, I think he could, I promise I will write the book about you. Oh. And um, yeah, so I, over all those years, there were times I feared I'll never get this done. And I was so thrilled. I am so thrilled that I did. Absolutely. And it wasn't easy, uh, largely because it was so personal, but also he wanted a book. He wanted there to be a book. And by the end, you were flooded with information from him. Just describe that process, what it meant to try to get him, this man, who lived 98 years, God bless him, on paper. Yeah. He, the, he began in this Hasidic family in Warsaw, uh, but his memories of Warsaw were so detailed, uh, so vivid, 
and he loved to talk about it. And I loved to listen. And the more he wanted to talk, the happier I was to listen. It was almost like he was creating this world and inviting me into it. Huh. Um, and so it started out with the assumption I would write about the Jewish community of Warsaw. Once he realized that I was writing his life, and I also realized there's so much there about his past, other than just that, it's, it expanded to be his whole life. He was writing out his memories. Uh, I gave him a tape recorder and cassette tapes. He was dictating memories. And he had such detailed memories of scenes of people. Every, he, he, this is very fascinating in itself. Uh, when he sat down to write his life, he retired at 70, so he had many years after, but he, when he sat down, when he retired, started writing his life, he listed the jobs he had held. Now, when I thought about his life, it was relationships, mm -hmm. and that was a big question that I was answering and asking him about uh, how he came to marry my mother, why they were married. There was a, another woman they talked about who he might have married, why did he marry my mother? Um, but his view of his life was the jobs that he held uh, and how, how, what a struggle it was to become a lawyer on those under those circumstances. But then that it took him so long to actually practice that profession. Uh, but for each of the, these 68 jobs, he talked about who the other people were and what the work was like and scenes from all of them. So that was hard to boil that down to what I would actually include in the book. And, and do, uh, do a little bit. It takes two full pages just of, of the images of his notes, of his lists. Yes, 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 yes. Of those jobs, but just skip over them. So skip through them uh, to give us all a sense of the variety of it. And then we'll get to the why. Yeah. Um, so he starts with when he had first come to this country, still didn't speak English. The first job was delivering telegrams. Uh, and he told these stories about um, people he delivered the telegrams to. That one, I think, is key. And I'll get back to it later. But he talks about how uh, he brought the tips home on Christmas and laid them out for his mother. And she was so relieved to have this money that she cried. That mm -hmm. stuck with him. Um, very early on, he was, I don't know, yeah, I think he was still 12. Uh, he said he, he went to buy shoes and Mrs. Rubin was the owner of the shoe store. And she mentioned to him that she was a widow. So he came back a couple of days later and offered to work for her and for, those two years till he quit and went full time in the factory, he worked for Mrs. Rubin shoe stores and became the shoe store and became very adept at um, uh, measuring feet and, and selling shoes. Um, the alcohol tax inspector really caught my attention because his description starts with, I gripped the gun I had hard and waited. My father <laughs> gripping the gun. He was many people referred to him as the gentle giant. He was he was only six feet tall. But in in our uh, neighborhood, I grew up in Brooklyn, which was uh, you were Jewish, Italian, or Irish. He was very tall, um, <laughs> gripping a gun. Yeah, they were they were chasing bootleggers, and that scene was uh, spending the night watching a house where a suspected bootlegger was, and he was waiting to see if he was going to come out with sugar which would be the clue uh, evidence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he ends the description by saying uh, he came out, he never did uh, come out with sugar. He was there for sweets of another kind. And my father was a good writer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, endless, endless series of jobs because he was always trying to figure out, this is to the depression, um, mm -hmm. what, what would work. So he, at one point, he and a partner had a series of, uh, they, they got uh, scooters and they rented them and it was so successful. They, they worked all through the night, people wanting, paying them for these rides on scooters. So they bought more scooters and then interest was gone. <laughs> uh, left with these scooters. But, but uh, look how in innovative he was to think, my goodness, it's yeah. not just fun for me, but this is a good way to make some money. Yes, yes. And then, of course, the one that was the big story of his life, if you uh, maybe will have time later to talk more about it. Um, he had taken civil service exams, as so many people had, 
and uh, one federal civil service exam resulted in his being offered a job as a prison guard in the federal penitentiary in Danbury, Connecticut. Now, being a prison guard may not sound to us like a great uh, opportunity, but um, they loved the life there. They had a house. They had only lived in cities. Uh, they had a house. They, everybody was happy there. Um, they had friends, other New York Jews who had gotten the job the same way. They had a community. Uh, but he ended up leaving, and, and he was doing very well. He was promoted to parole officer quickly. But then another civil service test he had taken came up with another job, and it paid slightly more, and it was in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, actually, he thought it was going to be New Haven, but it turned out to be Providence. So he left, and when he told the warden that in, in Danbury that he was going to leave, the warden was very upset, and he said, no, you're doing so great. You will be a warden in a year. And my father did not believe that a Jew would be promoted to warden. And the warden said, assured him that that was not an impediment. And he said, there are no Jews who are wardens. And the warden said, well, there have been no Jews in the system before, but he didn't believe it. And he left the job. The one other one, uh, this is, uh, again, how many details you want to get into? This is where my life comes in. My yeah. mother became pregnant with me, the third child, and didn't want to have the baby in Providence, so he left that job. They came back to New York, and that and then he ended up back in the factory as a cutter, which was so humiliating. He felt, I didn't understand he was humiliated, because as I was growing up, he gave no hint that mm -hmm. he was unhappy being a cutter. I had no idea. But I learned later, talking to him and reading what he wrote, uh, that it, he felt it was um, humiliating to him. And so he was active in politics so that he would get a political appointment to get out of the factory. It was not supposed to take 13 years. It was supposed huh? to take one or two, but it yeah. ended up being 13 years. And so, it was a lot of overtime. It was yeah. uh, incredibly hard to work on weekends as well, was it? Yes, yeah. yes, uh, working overtime. And I, now, it was well, and, and it, so I have to set the record straight here because he, he read something I wrote about him and he said, you say I was a cutter like it's a menial job. I was making $10,000 when it meant something. Uh, and yes. um, a friend of mine pointed out in a, in a book that she came across, uh, the Triangle Coat, coat Shirt, uh, yeah. shirt sure, Factory, sure, 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 that sure, was started sure. by a cutter who had broken the rules smoking when no one was allowed to smoke. And the author of the book explains the cutters were the divas of the coat factory. Uh, Nobody would tell them not to smoke because they were so looked up to. Oh, so that was interesting oh. for me to understand yes. what that meant. Um, but but, but was, what was this drive of job after job after job? What, what was it that fueled that? Because he, uh, it sounds as if he would accept anything as long as it was more, better paying than the last job he had. Yes, and, but also it was the depression and it was so difficult to support, to, to find a job and a stable job. And there was a lot of anti-Semitism. There were many jobs Jews couldn't have. Mm -hmm. But I came to understand, and this I think is connected to my saying that uh, to him, his life was a series of jobs. Whereas to me, it's a series of relationships. I think they come down to the same thing. His view of life was obligation. Yes. Throughout my life, I asked, what do I want to do? My father only ever asked, what do I have to do? Mm. The obligation to support his mother and sister because he had no father weighed so heavily on him. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, he felt he could never marry. And that's, if you want to ask about the marriage story, which is a big part of, of the book, it comes sure. right there. He felt he could never marry because he was responsible for supporting his mother and sister. Um, if he were to marry, that would mean the obligation. First of all, he was afraid it would, he believed that it would ruin the lives of his mother and sister because they didn't have anyone to support them. Um, his sister did marry not that long after he did. And his mother went to work and I'm sure was much happier working than- yes. um, lying yeah. on the couch, depressed. I'm sure she was depressed uh, when he was working. Because she, she in Poland had, was the founder and principal of a school. Mm -hmm. So she had education and status 
and a profession in Warsaw that she never was able to recapture here. And, and that is one of many ways that th I feel the story is an immigrant story. Um, yeah. I don't think I appreciate it until I read his journals. He left, he gave me journals he had kept before he married, um, before I read the journals and, and talked to him at such great length, how much they lost by becoming immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, and his mother clearly never recovered from the loss of a feeling of, of belonging and status that she had. Um, and my father, I think, never, that's why I think he talked so longingly and remembered so vividly his childhood in Warsaw, because there he was part of a large, very large family. Because he had no father, he lived with his mother and sister in his mother's uh, household, yes. mother, grandmother, and nine siblings that were living there when he was there, yeah. the war, that was probably a total of 16 to 18. Um, and so he, and so being part of that large family, which he spoke of so affectionately and longingly, he yeah. said, that's what I loved most, the liveliness, the warmth of so many aunts and uncles, and being part of a coherent community, that Hasidic community, um, and he described the neighborhood, and you said you couldn't walk out the door without running into a relative. All of that in this country reduced to a very unhappy, dysfunctional family mm -hmm. of three. And a mother who could never sh thank him or see his excellence or how hard he was working. It was always, what's the next thing, you know, or, or we're going to need money for this and this, even when she didn't have to, even, even when she had a big savings, some stuff tucked away. Deb, uh, I have, we have a note that you need to get a little bit closer to your microphone. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, not quite oh, goodness. Uh, as well. Okay, let's try that. And somebody tell me a note and tell me if it's okay, because I hear you fine. But that was the issue that she, uh, that drive and the extent to which she drove him. Well, she, Please. yeah, um, he didn't realize all those years that he was supporting her that she was putting away money. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and she would go through his pockets and take the money, the 15 cents he had saved to, for, for a car fare. Uh, but that's why I'm going to get back to that a anecdote I told when he was 12. Good. Didn't even speak English, but had gone to work. And uh, when he gave her his tips on, that he got on Christmas for delivering, um, that, she, uh, that she cried with gratitude. That is the only story he ever told in which she approved of him. And I think in some way that explained, I'm being a little bit of a psychological in, uh, interpreter here, I think that explains why he was so determined to quit school at 14. It turned out she tried to discourage him. That I didn't know. Uh -huh. later. Yeah, even though she was complaining bitterly about money, she did not want him to quit. Well, of course, I mean, she was the principal of a school. She believed in education. Yes. Why was he so determined? I think she always said to him, you're just like your father. Uh, and she would say his father was ugly. She wouldn't say that. You're as ugly as your father, but you know, oh, he was ugly and had this long nose. Mm -hmm. and, and you're just like your father, you're profligate, you don't know how to handle money, you're lazy. So I think he was proving that he was not like his father. The father abandoned her by dying so young. Mm -hmm. And that's what she was always so bitter about that my, mm -hmm. that her father, um, that her husband had her husband. Two, with these two children. And so yeah. I think it was, it was kind of a um, lifelong responsibility that he felt to make that up to her. But look what he did just psychologically. Uh, the man you described was always so good natured, always so dear, with the sense of humor. You never heard him complain, really. And so he took this, it's extraordinary psychology. That yeah. He took all of what life was handing him and so much of it was difficult didn't show it and funneled it into this, a certain joy, joy giving person. Yes. 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 And he really, he did have a sense of joy. He mm -hmm. appreciated everything uh, that way. He never complained. He only talked about, you know, once I said to him, daddy, you never complain. He said, I tried complaining once. It didn't help. 
<laughs> wonderful sense of humor. Yeah, yeah, wonderful sense of humor. Yeah, yeah. and when he was uh, You old. talked in this, uh, uh, has to do with the question that has come into us, and please, we encourage more questions from you uh, as well, um, about him being uh, from a Hasidic background, how, having to go to uh, Haida every day and study Hebrew and really study the, the Torah, all of that. Uh, but at the age of six, he becomes an atheist and never turns back, never turns around. So what was that about? Because he was obviously brilliant. He was a gifted, from a very little child, a gifted, gifted person. Yes, and this is one of the fascinating things about the journey that I try to figure out, his relationship mm -hmm. to Judaism and religion. So he was in Cheder, that's the uh, religious school that boys, not girls, boys were sent to um, in this community from the age of four, from sunrise to sunset. Mm -hmm. And he described with tremendous um, um, regret how many, his entire childhood was, was lost to that. He described sitting in the Cheder and looking wistfully, always use that word, wistfully out the window uh, watching them light the street lights with the gas lights. Um, but he says that he became an atheist because he could see that it didn't make any sense. Uh, the issue of atheism is, is inextricable from the issue of communism. He became an atheist and a communist mm -hmm. at six, at six, he told me. Uh, he, and this is so, to me, so fast. His life is like a window into history, the cataclysmic historical events yeah. of, of, the, of that era. Um, his mother's youngest sibling, youngest sister, was only six years older than my father, so he was more like an older sister than she was. And she had become swept up in the Bolshevik Revolution and the idealism of communism that was going to change the world. Um, and he followed her around and he listened and, and imbibed it. But I'll just tell you one anecdote about how he said Hader played into that. Um, the the Rebbe uh, was lecturing and said um, there was a, a rabbi who was so holy. If you look at him, you go blind in one eye. And if you look at him again, you go blind in the other eye. And if you look at him a third time, you're struck dead. And apparently he spoke up and said, well, how can you look at him a third time if you're blind? And the Rebbe went over and smacked him. Uh, uh, another time, he says he did, said something similar that was um, uh, disrespectful, questioning, uh, and he was picked up by his ear and, and it tore. So yeah. this, this was very, um, it was not an environment that inspired. Um, but w another uh, memory from Hader that I think is very significant in terms, again, his his uh, love of language and his ability with language. Uh, his one positive memory from Hader, he was tall, so he was always in the back, but when the, they expected a um, visitor that is a, you know, an, an authority to come to the class, they would always put him in the front uh, and say in the first row and say, well, let's have a boy read any boy, and they would pick my father because he read very fluently. Wow. He was five. Oh, <laughs> reading the Hebrew fluently. Yeah, yeah, which shows his brilliance. And uh, yeah, uh, our, our time is fleeting. I can't believe it. Well, we've got 98 years to cover. So <laughs> naturally that eats up time. But so let's talk about uh, your mother and their marriage and the nature of that. Uh, they had three girls, three daughters. You are the second, uh, the, no. Third, third. Yeah, the yes. third, you're the youngest of that. Okay, so how uh, he would leave every day, he, the days were spent uh, uh, without him, him and the absence of uh, his presence. Uh, but, but what about between them, what that marriage was like and what she was like? Yeah, let me say at the start, my parents were married 71 years and they were very in love with each other by the end. I mean, I think, think they probably always would, but clearly the images of their last years are so moving. I mean, he, they were both in a, a, he went to assisted living after she died. He was devastated when she died. He mm -hmm. lived two and a half more years. Uh, but they would, you know, go, there was a time that they were both in wheelchairs because um, 
she had fallen and, and uh, he was having trouble walking. So they're waiting for the dining room to open, holding hands across the wheelchairs. Uh, mm -hmm. Another moment stuck in my mind. He came in with his walker. We were in the living room. I was visiting. And instead of going to the chair he always sat in, he was going over to her. And she said, where are you going? He said, oh, I'm just going to give you a kiss. Oh, sweet. <laughs> so I, I want to make clear that that was definitely uh, their relationship. Yeah. On the other hand, my mother tended to be very unhappy. She was often unhappy. Uh, and in some ways, they seemed ill-matched. I mean, she, he was an intellectual, she wasn't. Um, but they both talked about the fact that she, uh, that there was this other woman who they referred to as her rival. And it was casual, it was not in any way loaded. Uh, but my father said, uh, once we were talking, she, I said, you know, something about your other girlfriend. He said, your mother wasn't my girlfriend. Helen was my girlfriend. Another time I said, well, were you dating mommy at the same time? He said, well, I never really dated your mother. Um, I guess I was sort of like a boyfriend, but, but only the last year. So wow. what, what was this behind me? What her? was it? And he frequently said, and my mother said, again, this was not secret. My mother said the same thing to me privately, you know, when we were just chatting. Had my, had my father known that Helen was not a virgin, he would have married her instead of my mother. Now, this is an astonishing statement. And figuring it out really helped me see the dilemma that women at the time faced with regard to managing virginity. So right. if I can try to be brief here, because you said the time's short, but I write about it at some length. Uh, and the drama, I think, of that whole relationship is was the most, one of the most meaningful parts for me to write in the book. But um, women, the, the assumption that my father made and that most men made at the time was, if you slept with a woman, you had to marry her because if you didn't, you were basically rendering her unmarriageable because no other man would either. Clearly that's not true because of the story I'm about to tell, but that was the belief. Because he couldn't marry, because he was responsible for his mother and sister, he felt he could not have sex with a virgin because he couldn't marry. Well, how come he married my mother? And again, my mother was one who told me this, not my father. Um, hmm. Apparently, they well, they were having sex, and there's a long story how I figured it out, But and, and eventually they both told me indirectly. But um, because what they were having sex, and I'm quite certain that he, she, she had said, well, I'm not a virgin, so it's not, you, you won't be obligated. But then after a while, she really wanted to get married. He didn't, he was saying he couldn't. Mm -hmm. And so it really made her sick. And um, she couldn't keep food down. She was crying from mm -hmm. morning till night. She, um, she was losing weight. Mm -hmm. And my father felt it was his fault and that he needed to do the right thing. And so on impulse, they eloped. And the interesting thing is they went off on a honeymoon to the Catskills, but they came back to their respective homes. I don't think they expected to immediately live together Lived because them. he was still going to support his mother and sister. I think oh, that's my how he made that decision. Uh, however, their secret was out. The, uh, they had married in City Hall, so advertisements had come to the house and um, her father found out and then, then they had a Jewish wedding. and. But this is the end of the story, at least from my point of view. Wait, I have to ask something yes. before you get to the next part. Yes. Uh, because you also, you describe her as um, a pretty little schemer, your mother. And she okay. comes across as extremely manipulative and okay. quite judgmental with you girls. But in, those, in these days, these pre-marriage and let let's work it out so I do get married days. Yes, and, and I will say, um, I had many stories from my own life where I felt that my mother had manipulated me into mm -hmm. doing things. And there was one drama, I was supposed to go into Peace Corps, and my mother, same thing, that my father, she did really with my father, although I don't think it was intentional. I think she really felt that way. Um, she cried from morning till night. I would come home and she would just meet me at the door with eyes red and swollen from crying. And she did everything she could to talk me out of going. I was going to be killed by a 
stray bullet from the Vietnam War. Oh, I was 21. Wow. Uh, when I came home, I'd be 23 and I'd be too old to get married. All the marriageable, men, you know, all the men would have gotten married while I was away. And and it got to me and I, at the last minute, the night before I was supposed to leave, I, I changed my mind and I canceled. Oh boy. And for years, it was a tremendous source of, of regret. Uh, so when I read in my father's journals that he kept before he got married, uh, how she was manipulating him into spending time with her. And my mother too, my mother said to me when she was old, I was so aggressive, I can't believe it. I kept trying to get him to spend time with me. But um, so when I first read the journals, I had a sense of satisfaction. Like, you see, my experience of her yeah. wasn't just me, it was similar. And so I was very critical of the way she got him to marry her. Mm -hmm. It felt like she had tricked him mm -hmm. uh, by first saying it's not going to mean anything and then saying, yeah, now, now it does mean something. Um, but I'll just tell you the ending of the story that I really ended up believing that she saved him. She gave him a life. He was going to stay in that miserable situation with his mother and sister until his mother got married and set him free. Uh, he was not going to get married and set right. him free. And honestly, it was not good for his mother either. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure she was happier after she went out and went to work. So I think my, my mother saved him and gave him a life. Mm. And the, lively, the liveliness and warmth of a family is what they created together. Yes, uh, and it's what he so cherished. Yes, yeah. so I don't think it's anything he would have seen because he would never have done what he thought was good for himself. He was only going to do what he felt obligated to do. And so I think by her making her, his obligation to her greater than to his mother's, she saved him. That's really interesting, isn't it? But it's, it also sounds very typical of what you said of him. That is, the obligations were there and looking towards others rather than his own happiness, which yes. brings us to Helen. Yes. Uh, so this is one of the big dramas for me in, in uh, researching the book. Um, my father said to me once, I saved Helen's letters, but I don't know where they are. So that got me thinking, if I could see these letters, I would- Wait, have you heard of a Helen when he said this to you? They, they talked about Helen. Yes, yes, they talked as about As a friend her. of the family or somebody no, they knew? No, as, as my mother's rival. They, you know, they referred uh -huh, to her. Uh -huh. yeah, my, mother would, my mother would say, so she was a secretary where my father was working at the time. Uh, and why was she working where he was working? He gave her the job because he was friends with her and her three brothers were his closest friends. So he was very tight with the family. That's another reason I think his marrying her was inevitable, that he had kind of adopted her family as a substitute uh -huh. for his own. Um, yeah, no, she told me that Helen would call and my mother would answer the phone and at the office and say he wasn't in. So she, she was not, she wasn't a secret. Um, but he told me that he had saved her letters and then one day uh, I was visiting and he said he was going to go down to the storage room in their condo. And I said, I'll, I'll come with you. And when I got there and we, he found whatever he was looking for, I said, how about we look for those letters? <laughs> and he said, sure. He was very organized. So this was not a big project. If it was my storage room, it would take a year. But everything was labeled. <laughs> and um, we went, looked at everything and, and we hadn't found it. There was one carton left. It was on the highest shelf over in a corner and I and I reached out and I pulled it away to look at it and I heard a plop. So I reached behind and <gasps> here was the envelope with the letters and I looked inside and not only was it all these nicely folded letters still with their stamped envelopes but these sheets, these typed sheets. My father had kept copies of many of the le his letters to her. Oh my Goodness. Well, I jumped <laughs> up and down with these. I was so excited and he laughed. He smiled and with amusement at me and he said, take them. And um, yeah, so part of it was reading these letters and putting them in order mm -hmm. uh, so that I could reconstruct the relationship and the conversation. And um, yeah, it got to be kind of like a, that's a little bit of a mystery and- uh, Well, tell about her. What did you discover? Who was she and what well, kind of a person? Yeah, um, I fell in love with her a bit myself. 
she was sensitive. She was a great writer. Um, she was a beautiful writer. Uh -huh. uh, and she was very considerate of him. So when he was often breaking off, you know, we can't, we can't, uh, I can't meet you at this time because you're, um, you know, I have to study. And she would say, oh, of course you should study, no problem. His journals were full of, he would tell my mother he has to study and she'd say, no, you don't, you know, <laughs> you can study it later. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, um, but the, it, the, the relationship went to span three years. It did start very romantically. Um, but by really a series of just, just lining the dates up, uh, apparently his relationship with her got more it, it kind of was romantic in the beginning and then it was, you know, kind of, they didn't see each other so often. And then it kind of heated up again, just that same last year that he seemed to have gotten more involved with my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and so- uh, But they were having re assignations. Helen would get uh, a, a, yes, a break and she would go away and then he would meet her wherever. Is, is that right? Or, or um, she no, was, they, or the other way around? There was this one dramatic element that my father always talked about if Helen had gone with me, he would say, if Helen had gone with me to the Thousand Islands, that's when we would have, our relationship would have been such that I would have ended up marrying her uh -huh. had she gone with me to the Thousand Islands. And I was, a, oh, you know, the, the name, the Thousand Islands, it's so dramatic in itself. Um, so uh, I was astonished to find in the letters references to the Thousand Islands. He never went. Uh, she writes, oh, I see you're in the Catskills. That's not, that's very far from the Thousand Islands. Uh, and she does keep offering to go to join him there. And he apparently never took her up on it. Uh -huh. So I think he kind of changed it in his mind. I think in his mind, the Thousand Islands came to stand for what would have happened if our relationship had been constant. Yes. That clearly had he started sleeping with her, he would not have slept with someone else. So, huh. Huh. Yeah. But, uh, but no, it's quite heartbreaking because she, she, she is, has no idea that he's getting married. I mean, and there's, she clearly tells him, he's telling her that he's very upset about something, but not saying what it is. Uh, and he, um, I, as I say, I know that they decided to get married on, uh, on impulse and they eloped, so he didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. there's a, uh, one of the, her last letters, she's trying to call him and he's on his honeymoon. Oh my God. But he, yeah, then he called her and told her he's married. Uh -huh. That was it. Uh -huh. Well, he was obviously so torn by this and uh, wanting two things at once and maybe one more than the other, but it wasn't quite permissible. And you know, he never, I, oh, I, and I'm a little embarrassed to admit this. I, I, I kept getting him to try to admit tell me which one he actually would have preferred to marry. And I was pretty sure he would have, would have preferred to marry uh, Helen. He would never, he never ever said it. Uh -huh. He always said it didn't matter who you married. The difference was if you're married, you're responsible for supporting a family. Mm -hmm. If you're not, you're free. And that was, he, his dream was to be free. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, and I think he really felt that way that, but, you know, from what you discovered, she really was a lovely person. And you write that you started rooting for her. I know, I know. <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, I, as I was reading the letters, I was falling in love with her myself, as I said. And then I said, what am I doing? I'm rooting for her. But if he chooses her, I don't exist. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I magical thinking. I, I think on some level, I had in my mind decided maybe she would have been a better wife, but also I think in some um, I, irrational way, had he married her, I would have had a different mother. I don't think that's, <laughs> <It's true enough. laughs> I don't think I ever thought it consciously, <laughs> obviously it's not true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, what do you think? No, but I think I, I did end up feeling that, that my mother um, saved her, saved him. And, and she, he's clearly very much in love with her. Yes. You know, shortly after they marry. Yes, yes. Um, uh, one of the questions that came in a little earlier, and I'd love to see some more, please. We need to hear from uh, you viewers. Um, was the uh, the traits in him that shaped you? What would you say? What were the big influences? Well, his intelligence, sure. Oh, and thank you. And uh, that wish to doc for documentation. 
Well, the writing, is also a gift of yours. The writing, the love of language. Um, I found myself thinking, yeah, my father spoke uh, Polish, Yiddish, English. He read Hebrew. His native language was writing. That's where he could express ah. himself. Um, ah. And he, he loved to write long, long, long letters. He had correspondence you know, all over the world. Um, the love of language, when I, you know, uh, he, from him I learned to always have a dictionary handy in case there was a word that I didn't know the meaning or wasn't sure, sure of the pronunciation. You know, now I have the dictionary in my phone and that's great, I don't have to get up. Uh. When I would walk across the room to the dictionary, I always felt my father was walking with me. And I miss that walk with my father to the dictionary. Yeah. Um, but th there's also a sad part. Uh, there was always a sense in my family of regret. That decision my father made mm. to leave the job in Danbury, Danbury, where everybody was happy and he loved the work too, to go to Providence and then end up these 13 years in the factory um, because he thought Odu would never be a warden. When he left, the person that was promoted, given his job as parole officer, a year later was made warden and he was Jewish. And he was Jewish. So he had this obvious evidence that he had made a mistake. Um, and that feeling of regret kind of pervaded our household. Uh, I've talked to my sisters about that. They, they perceive it too. Um, and I think that gave me a real fear of making decisions and a tendency to regret. I mean, you could uh, tap me on the shoulder anytime. And do it sometime. I'll start telling you. <laughs> I have <laughs> endless lists of, of, of things I regret. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so that's... What did you, you mentioned your sisters and I've had contact <laughs> with them uh, just once, but very memorable. By the way, they're uh, in the see. audience. They're in the audience today, but you can't call them to. Oh, hello, hi, <laughs> Naomi and Mimi. Hello. <laughs> uh, but tell what their reactions were to this book. Um, first of all, I am so grateful to them. Uh, they have been helping me along the way the entire time. I'm constantly calling them up and saying, "Do you remember this? Do you remember that?" Um, they they help me understand perspectives that I didn't get. Uh, and I have to particularly credit Mimi because I, both Naomi and I tended to uh, idolize my father and, and be very critical of my mother. And Mimi keeps me on the straight and narrow there, pointing out when I'm being unfair to our mother and uh, maybe a little too fair to <laughs> our father. Uh, uh, but they have been so generous in allowing, in, I mean, it's their story too. Yeah. And, um, uh, and I will credit Naomi. Naomi um, has um, returned to Judaism in a way that the rest of us never did. We were raised about atheists. <clears throat> Naomi um, was very drawn to Jewish spirituality. And um, she pointed out to me that although my father gave up Hasidism, he kept the perspective mm -hmm. and um, values of Hasidism. And I love this example that she pointed out to me. He would make fun of the uh, Hasidim he grew up with. You had to say a prayer over everything. You had to say a prayer over washing your hands, going to the toilet. But then he would say to us, we're so lucky. We have delicious water coming from the faucet. We have flush toilets. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what those prayers are about. The yes. prayers are about gratitude. And he yeah. had that, that stance of gratitude. He held that. Well, and, and you also say he never, he may have given up on the religion, but he never give, gave up on the Jewishness. He was Jewish to the core and very, uh, I, I asked him once, and perhaps it was a foolish question because I knew the answer. I said, do you feel uh, more, more Polish or more American? And he said, I feel like a Jew. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, did, he didn't feel completely American because he was born there. He actually wrote in a letter to um, an aunt, this beloved aunt who was still in Poland. Um, he was 25, he was married, he was a lawyer. And he wrote to her, I have never felt part. I have always felt myself part of that life that I lived in Poland and not of the life that I'm living here. Yeah. And I think he always felt that way. But of course, in Poland, you were Jewish, you were not 
considered a, a, a full citizen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that Jewish identity was, was primary, primary to him. It's interesting that he had such sweet memories of, uh, of being a little boy in, in Warsaw, uh, because it certainly was not all sweetness and light there. There were deaths, there were separations, there was great suffering as well. And yet, well, maybe it's typical of him. Again, he chooses to remember the warm family moments, that feeling. Uh, yes, yes, I think that's very possible. Before World War I, so he was six when the war broke out. Mm -hmm. Before World War I, they had a comfortable life. Um, they lived in a big apartment and, the, and the, his aunts were all very highly educated. Uh, one was um, a physicist and mathematician who studied with Einstein, another uh, was a dentist, so they, they were professional. Um, the war was very, very hard. Yeah. Uh, they were, um, there was a, not enough, they were hungry all the time, <clears throat> they were cold in the winter. But that feeling of being with a large part of a large family and part of a community, I think overrode it for him and, and the contrast with, with the life in this country. Yeah, I think you need to tell about the aunt and Einstein just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, because they won't my, believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my grandmother, my father's mother, um, so she was educated, she was principal of the school, and her sisters also were highly educated. Uh, the brothers were not. Uh, one of her sisters, uh, her name was Dora. This is the story I always knew and always heard. She had studied with Einstein in Switzerland. Um, then she came to and had had apparently had had an affair with him in Switzerland, but I have less evidence for that. Then she comes to this country and shortly after my father did, then Einstein came to this country and she went to Princeton to be with him and apparently did stay there for several years and there rekindled their affair. Um, I had been told that she became pregnant with him with his child and had an abortion. Uh, this was told to my father by the sister who was a dentist. And so she was the older sister, she was a medical professional. So that would make sense that the, um, that Dora asked her for her help getting mm -hmm. the abortion. Um, and now of course, you know, Einstein, lover of Einstein, that all seems the kind of thing families make up, but um, I, I do write in the book all the I, I did find a fair amount of external evidence supporting that, supporting yeah. that. Yeah. I, I, we do know, I do know that they were close because I did find in the Einstein archive a handwritten letter of recommendation that Einstein wrote for her. And it says, I have known her for many years and um, she's very intelligent, very capable um, and, and recommending her for a teaching job, which apparently she never got. And this is yeah. to me, again, the, heartbreak of immigrant stories, especially women. Uh, she never got a, a, was able to practice her profession here. Uh, oh yeah, my father overheard her telling her sisters that Einstein told her she's one of only 10 people in the world that truly understand his theory of relativity. Oh, good. Maybe, maybe he said that to all the girls. You know. <laughs> oh, you say that to all the girls, right? Yeah. Oh, isn't that incredible? But she must have been extraordinary. Too. But she, uh, yeah, so she ended up, she's on the 1940 census as a house worker. Huh. And I have a letter that my father saved every piece of paper that came into his life. And some, I don't know where he found them and how he got them. But this was a copy of a letter that Dora wrote to her sister, um, again, the one, uh, the one who was a dentist. And um, she says in the letter uh, that she is crocheting baby jackets. And if she can break into the Hollywood crowd and sell them, she thinks she'll be able, she'll do okay. Oh my, oh my. Physicist and mathematician, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is, a, a go, going back, uh, quite a bit from where we are now um, as we wrap up. Describe what is the job of a cutter? That yeah. work that he did in the factory and work not just the day but over time and over time to add up, get enough money to take home. Yes, yes. Uh, so the, this is the garment industry in New York. Um, 
So they, in the coat factory, they would um, pile up maybe a hundred, uh, depending on how thick the uh, fabric was, pile up the fabric, lay the pattern on it, and cut it out. And apparently, it was up to the cutter to put the pieces in the most uh, efficient way so that uh -huh. they could get the most pieces out of out of this fabric. And apparently, he was really good at that. And then you took this electric saw and and cut through cut all out. of it. Yeah, and so you cut through the entire, um, you know, pile, and, and then you took that. Then you had a runner. So when he was fourteen, he was he was the one who would then take those fabrics and run with them to the to the wherever the um, uh, people were with the sewing machines. Yeah, that, that would sew it up. Um, yeah, but it was skilled. It was dangerous. And they were unionized. That was the huge thing. The uh -huh. cutters were unionized, which meant they got paid overtime if they yes. worked extra hours, um, and they and they couldn't and they had to be kept. He he describes in his journal when he was a not a cutter that the cutters worked certain hours and that was that was respected, but for the for him they were told to work Saturday and not paid extra. They could be told to work, stay extra hours, and not be paid extra, um, and the contrast was very was very significant. Mm -hmm. So how how is it for you to be finished with this project, knowing and you're having explained so eloquently what it has meant to you all this time? Because uh, you've got him; he's between hard covers now, but. It, yeah, you know, are you finished with him? <laughs> never, never. Well, you know, now I've got him forever. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah, um, there's this image that I that I uh, used. You know, I hadn't thought initially of the book as being about um, creating that connection to my father that I had so yearned for as a child. But in retrospect, I realized that that is something that I was able to do. So all that time reading all this stuff, going back over all the material, I was keeping those conversation going, those conversations going. Um, so this tremendous sense of satisfaction that I did it. I was afraid something might get in my way before I actually did it. Sure. Um, so I feel in a way I've, I've repaid him for all those hours that he spent with me. Uh, and, and the um, legacy of, of language and of writing that he gave me. And so in a way, all my books and my love of language and my using language as my cre career, uh, this is a debt to him. And maybe, maybe in a way I've begun to repay it. But I get to keep it with me now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, congratulations on it. One last question, and I must give it, even if our time is running out, because it comes from your sister Mimi, who says, <laughs> who says, so, when are you going to write about mommy? <laughs> <laughs> I have my assignment. <laughs> yes. Actually, I did. The book you were in that? Sort of. <laughs> well, and you did it with, uh, with mothers and daughters. And, you know, she's, she's been lurking there, really, on yeah. most of the pages in one way or another. Yeah. No, You're no, getting lovely true. notes, Deborah from people saying how lovely to see you again, met you and your college roommate, Amy Tan. Is that right? You and Amy Tan were roommates? We weren't roommates, but we uh, both started the PhD program at Berkeley in linguistics the same year. Oh my goodness, good heavens. She, she found something better to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's been a delight being with you and uh, so many congratulations to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Susan. You were pleasure. so wonderful to talk to. And a for pleasure. coming with me on this journey. Yes, I did, and it was a good one. I would like to thank you both, Deborah Tannen and Susan Stanberg for your wonderful conversation. <laughs> Once again, everyone, um, you can use the link in the chat to purchase a copy of Finding My Father from Politics and Pro's website. One last question before we do go. Is there anything you're currently reading? And if it is, can you please share that with everyone? Yes. I, f I go first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I am reading Richard Ford's latest collection of short stories. Sorry for your trouble. Ah, 
Well, I'm reading, but I'm browsing, but it's for very personal reasons. This, can you see it? May Day, May Day 1971 by Lawrence Roberts, uh, because it's not about, but it certainly mentions the fact that this uh, May Day was the day on which All Things Considered went on the air for the first time, a, a broadcast that I was associated with uh, for most of my professional life. And uh, that first broadcast, he mentions it from uh, in little bits and snippets. I mean, it's about the day itself when uh, protesters, anti-war, anti-Vietnam war protesters tried to shut down the government in protests and almost succeeded. It was a day of incredible chaos at a time really of kind of a national nervous breakdown. And so this is, uh, it's really a reminder of many things, many, many things. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And once again, uh, thank everyone who has joined us for this event. And we hope to see you all again at one of our future events. Have a good Thanks. one. Thanks. Thank you all Bye, for Deb. coming. Bye.